No, welcome to the Benji Brooks session. I am pleased to introduce the moderators for this session today. Uh, Dr. Aaron Perrone is Associate Professor of Pediatric Surgery at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and is the chair of the Benji Brooks Committee. Uh, Claudia Imami down here is the section chief at Huntington Hospital in Los Angeles, California and is the vice chair of the Benji Brooks Committee. Uh, Emily Onifer is a clinical PGY4 at Washington University in St. Louis and our chat monitor today is Roxanne Masumi from the University of California, Los Angeles. Thank you all. I'll turn it over to you, Erin. Thank you, Dr. Henry. So I have had the distinct honor of serving as the chair of the Benji Brooks Committee this last year. We only became a committee about three years ago now. Um, and it's been amazing getting to know all of these um, people who are you know, trying to push our uh, um, issues that affect women, but it affects all of us really um, forward. And we want to thank the program committee for giving us the space this morning. Um, this is our very first session that we've ever been uh, granted, so hopefully you like it. <laughs> and we, of course, want to thank those who are joining us virtually, because I know a lot of people are needing to travel, um, and it will be recorded for anyone who needs. So, from the most recent data I've seen, approximately 30% of our membership are women, and 40% of our fellow trainees also identify as women. Some of these amazingly accomplished surgeons will also choose to become parents. And today, we're going to show what the reality of that looks like for some. Fertility and pregnancy in the surgeon has been a topic that is only recently gaining attention, as it can be a hard and uncomfortable conversation. But as pediatric surgeons, we don't steer away from hard and uncomfortable conversations. We have them every day. Um, and we, I want to warn the audience that there may be some things that are hard to hear and triggering for some, so we respect that. We want to have a safe space to share or feel what you need. And at the end, we will have an open conversation um, for anyone who's willing to share, and we thank you for that in advance. And now I'm going to invite Dr. Emily Onifer to uh, uh, introduce our speakers. So as she said, we're going to have um, four esteemed speakers. Um, each will have about 10 minutes, and then we'll leave 15 minutes at the end, so if we'll leave all questions for the end. Um, our first speaker will be Erica Rangel, um, who is a general surgeon um, in GI and an intensivist at um, Brigham Women's Children's Ho or Brigham Women's Hospital, excuse me. Um, and today she'll be talking to us and giving us the cold truth about the data surrounding um, surgeon fertility as well as pregnancy complications. Um, so I have been a trailing spouse at this meeting for many years, um, so I've been lucky to meet and uh, meet a lot of you, call a lot of you friends. I'm super excited to come, not as a trailing spouse, but to talk about something I'm really passionate about. Um, um, Dr. Perone asked me to talk about the challenges of parenthood for surgeons and some of the data surrounding infertility and pregnancy complications and kind of how workplace support factors into all of that. Um, no disclosures. So the issues surrounding parenthood for surgeons have become increasingly highlighted in society meetings and the literature, and we're talking about it a lot more among peers. Um, you know, half of incoming surgical residents, or almost half of them, are now women, and training takes place during the prime childbearing years. So it's really not a big stretch of the imagination to understand why pregnancy is going to be part of the lives of a really growing group of surgeons. Prioritization of family and personal needs are increasingly recognized as critical components of a successful um, and sustainable surgical career. And it's really not something that's necessarily new to the incoming generation of surgeons, but I think it's probably a little bit more widely discussed. And if you look at the data from retired surgeons, they'll even tell you that the most commonly cited regret is that they hadn't spent more time with family or they hadn't taken better care of themselves. So national professional organizations are now endorsing longer parental leave policies, but we really haven't had as much focus on local institutional policies that safeguard maternal fetal health. So um, having kids as a surgeon is really hard, um, and it's hard whether you're a trainee or you're in practice. Residents have stigma and discrimination. They often feel unsupported by faculty and peers. 
Um, they describe having very little infrastructure related, related to uh, modifications of their work schedule or for pregnancy and lactation. Practicing surgeons have negative attitudes from co uh, colleagues. They may face financial penalties for reducing or changing their schedules, may be asked to miss, uh, make up all their missed call, and a lot of them describe children as being detrimental to their career advancement. And so tension between those professional demands and the family needs is now a well-recognized source of burnout and career regret, um, decreased professional longevity, and thoughts of attrition. So we know physically demanding aspects of surgery, like night shifts, long work hours, and prolonged standings, standing is associated with increased obstetric risk. Um, we looked at uh, 670 pregnant surgeons through seven uh, surgical societies. And we found most pregnant surgeons work over 60 hours a week, take more than four uh, overnight call shifts a month, and operate more than 12 hours a week. And that kind of schedule can be detrimental to maternal fetal health. So nearly half of surgeons have a major pregnancy complication. They have a 1.7 greater odds of having a major pregnancy complication like preeclampsia, placental abruption, placenta previa, IUGR, preterm labor, or placental insufficiency. And the ones that operate more than 12 hours a week are the ones that are at highest risk. So professional culture norms, um, including, including the deferment of self-care and pregnancy-related stigma, plus significant financial losses during parental leave really may discourage surgeons from taking, um, making any changes in their schedule during a pregnancy, even if they feel like they want to. And I think that, so we, we have data that shows that that type of low workplace support for clinical work reductions is also associated with a two and a half fold higher risk of pregnancy complications. And that poor workplace support is a major driver of a multitude of longer term consequences as well. So even when you control for pregnancy complications, um, the negative work environment surrounding pregnancy extends beyond that immediate health risk and gives a 2.2 higher uh, fold risk of postpartum depression, um, 1.6 higher risk of uh, burnout, low quality of life, and um, those pregnant surgeons are less likely to recommend surgery as a career to somebody they love. Um, poor, well, poor well-being and career regret um, really shouldn't be surprising because the negative outcomes of pregnancy are really a profound example of when work commitments clash with personal priorities, and that's something in the literature that they call uh, work-home conflict. Um, I think the risk to infant health is probably a lot uh, more upsetting for the affected surgeons than the risk to their own health because we're inherently very protective as parents. And so there's this clash between cultural expectations and surgery and concern um, that the behaviors we're accustomed to seeing in surgeons is actually really not good for the pregnancy, it's not good for the unborn baby. And people sometimes will ask me, you know, what do we do about these iron-willed women that just, they just really want to work during pregnancy? And I think, to be fair, some people really do have smooth pregnancies, that's great. They feel like they can work throughout. But I also want to point out that there's a lot of literature about this concept of presenteeism in medicine and in surgery in particular. So if you look at um, residents, more than half of them work while sick, and this is like all residents, including surgeons. Um, if you look at uh, surgeons at Memorial Sloan Kettering, 75% of them won't allow themselves a day off even if they operate on a Saturday. 15% uh, of them take all their vacation time. And it's probably not because they want to keep working because if you look at the Sloan Kettering surgeons, they say um, it's really taboo to talk about personal distress at work. Very few of them think that burnout is a priority for their leadership. So presenteeism is a very unhealthy behavior that all of us have picked up during training and then it goes through until we're in practice. So our culture of deferring self-care runs deeper than just presenteeism. It's really fed into and impacted by our policies or the lack thereof of those policies. And if you look at scholars of organizational culture, they talk about how important it is to really align organizational values with personal ones. So until we have policies that safeguard maternal fetal health, if you take time off to reduce your schedule during pregnancy, it's always gonna feel a little bit like you're going against what the workplace values. Maybe you're disappointing your colleagues or not fulfilling their expectations. And surgeons, we fear nothing if not fearing being called weak, right? So if you look at um, the survey of 560 pregnant female surgeons who were not on bed rest, three quarters of them actually wanted to reduce their schedule during 
um, pregnancy, but they felt unable to. So this graph on the right shows the reasons they didn't reduce their schedule. Um, and so in the red box, these are the common concerns that relate to presenteeism. So for example, they're worried about burdening their colleagues with extra work or they don't want to be called weak. Um, <clears throat> and then another group face these policies that undermine or the lack of policies that undermine the ability to take time off, like the requirement to make a missed call, being told the workplace won't accommodate them, um, or being told they're going to have big financial loss. And if you look um, that slide was mostly in practicing surgeons because we went through surgical societies, but when you look at residents, the pattern is really similar. So the second uh, trial has given us this really rich data to understand cultural issues in surgery that relate to resident discrimination, mistreatment, bias. Um, and working with this really great team on the 2021 Absite survey, we got a chance to ask about the workplace environment specifically as it relates to pregnancy and parenthood. And one of the great things about this trial is the really robust response rate. So um, that really reduces bias. So we got almost 6,900 uh, surgical residents, which represents 82% of all of our clinical general surgery trainees in the US. And so for purposes of my work, I'm looking at the 965 who became parents during their training. And we found really similar data to the society distributed surveys, right? So 41% having pregnancy complications, higher pregnancy complication rates in the female residents compared to the partners of the male residents. And that's really worrisome when you think about how much younger the surgical residents are than the attendings. Um, and that data really also reinforces our concerns about the workplace culture surrounding having a child during training. So in resident moms, low workplace support manifests as higher uh, frequency of duty hour violations and all forms of mistreatment which are shown there in green. And similar to what we see in the other studies, those workplace conditions, when you couple them with pregnancy complications, becomes this really toxic combination that has longer term consequences than just those immediate health risks. So higher risk of thoughts of attrition, higher risk of suicidal ideation. And that difficult environment surrounding pregnancy also impacts family planning. This 2018 study of Stanford residents discusses the concerns that residents have that parenthood is gonna violate professional expectations. Two-thirds of them worry that parental leave is going to be a burden on their colleagues. About half of them say they're concerned about how they're going to be perceived if they have a child or that having a child is going to negatively impact their career advancement. And for surgeons, putting off um, pregnancy really has consequences on infertility, even more so than in other specialties because our training is really long, right? Um, women end up having fewer children. They're more likely to need assisted reproduction to have a child. They're less likely than their male colleagues to have the number of children they desire. Um, Dr. Dugart is really the pro with infertility. Um, she's going to give us a more detailed overview of what's involved. But from sort of the surgeon's perspective, presenteeism is seen even during this really difficult IVF journey. Despite the invasiveness of the process, a third of surgeons take no time off to do it, and two-thirds of them take less than three days off. So we really come back to that pressure to be eternally present, um, which extends from pregnancy-related health issues to infertility to miscarriages. 42% of female surgeons have a miscarriage, which is more than double the age-matched rate of the uh, population. And even when faced with pregnancy losses, the dark blue bars tell you all the tell you the proportion of surgeons who take zero days off work. Even when you look at later pregnancy losses after 10 weeks, the majority still take no time off. So what I'm trying to show you here that is that there's a cycle, right? The guilt and stigma that drive a lot of our behavior is the product of a long-standing culture in medicine and surgery in particular where we focus on productivity. Personal needs are still considered a sign of weakness. Pregnancy is viewed as a hardship on colleagues and an obstacle to surgical workflow. And when you combine um, that, when you combine that workplace and training policies that penalize time for parenting or for trying to become a parent, whether these are social or financial penalties, the result is that nobody dares to change the status quo and surgeons are just going to keep working 80 hours a week and taking all this call until they deliver. They're not going to ask for changes in their call schedule or their OR commitments. So we really shouldn't be surprised that the pregnancy complication rates are what they are or that young surgeons are worrying about the complications so much that they're delaying having children and facing infertility later. And so I think these health issue, issues alone should be really compelling reasons 
um, that we should change, but the bigger picture is that these struggles drive misgivings about the ability to balance pregnancy and parenthood with career demands, and that's something that we know leads at, to burnout, career regret, and shorten practice longevity. And so the impact on our workforce really highlights the need for us to make change, and at the end, Dr. Kim's gonna share some ideas um, for a durable change. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Ringel. Um, our next speaker will be Catherine Diogarde, who is an accomplished fertility specialist in Los Angeles, as well as a professor at UCLA. Um, she'll be giving us a brief overview of IVF. Good morning. Thank you again for inviting me. As you uh, well know, um, my husband, Daniel Diogarte, is a pediatric surgeon here, and uh, I'm grateful to be here with all of you. Surgical programs lengths can vary between five to nine years, and most female surgeons starting residency are between 24 and 30 years old. We have choices as physicians. We can either choose not to have children, we can wait till after residency or fellowship when we're 29 to 35, we can decide to have a baby during residency and fellowship, or we can freeze eggs or embryos during training. So this is my family. I was very lucky to meet my husband about 20 years ago or so at UCLA when we were both residents. And between us, there's 24 years of training, eight boards, and two babies. The first one came um, during my fellowship and his residency, and baby number two came after fellowship for Dan and about two years after fellowship for me in between jobs. So it worked out pretty well in terms of planning. Uh, doggy came recently. In terms of how um, age and female fertility affects our thought process during residency and fellowship, is male fertility does not decrease as much as female fertility. It's a very slow decrease. However, with women, um, we have about a million eggs when we're born. By the time we're teenagers, we've lost more than half of our eggs. And by the time we're in our 30s and 40s, most of our good eggs are gone. So when we're 40, the chance of getting pregnant per month is only about 5% chance per month. Not only is it difficult to get pregnant when we're women, it's also difficult to stay pregnant as miscarriage rate rise as we age as well. So how can we check if we're fertile during residency or fellowship? Um, there are three things we can do. There's an ultrasound that has to be done ideally day two or three of the cycle um, where we can check how many follicles there are. The more follicles in the ovary, the better. And that's um, increased in patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome. The antrophollicle count decreases with age. And there are several hormones we can check for. One is called the AMH. I also call it amine hormone because it's low in a lot of us. It's produced by the granulosa cell in the ovary, and it decreases with age, also increased in PCOS patients. And the ideal level is greater than one. This can be done anytime during a cycle, even if you're on birth control pills or if with an IUD in place. The FSH level and the estradiol level are two other hormones that are important to check how fertile we are. This has to be done on day two or three of the cycle, and ideal level of FSH is under 10, and estradiol should be under 50. The hysterosalpingogram is a test to check your uterus and tubes if you're having str uh, trouble getting pregnant. Um, that's one of the tests we recommend. It is a painful test. It's done after a period, and it checks to see if the uterus is open and if the fallopian tubes are open, if the uterus has any polyps or fibroids, that is. The semen analysis, and this is our daughter, by the way. She learned about the birds and the bees very early on. <laughs> And um, we um, check for semen analysis, we check how much sperm is in the cup, ideally two cc's, there should be 20 million per milliliters, at least 50% of them should be moving, and more than 4% should be normal. So in terms of treatment options for patients who have infertility, there's either pills or shots. We can do something called an intrauterine insemination, where we put the sperm directly into the uterus, also obviously for single women or same-sex couples. Um, a lot of them get pregnant uh, by intrauterine inseminations or IVF. IVF is reserved for patients who, are, who have failed other um, technologies or who want to freeze their eggs or embryos in the future or who need to go through a process such as donor eggs and surrogacy. So who should freeze their eggs or embryos? Um, anybody who's not ready for kids, um, because the age, as we talked about, only gets worse in terms of egg quality. Um, however, I do have patients who have medical reasons, such as unfortunate cancer diagnosis, who need to freeze their eggs before chemotherapy, um, or patients who have fragile eggs or premature menopause in their family. 
This is a good calculator that I use for most of my patients who, when we discuss egg freezing. Anybody can do this. This actually came out of Brigham and Women. Um, and it's a calculator. You go to mdcalc.com. You plug in your age and how many mature eggs and what the chances are of having a baby. So I use this with a lot of my patients uh, once we um, get, get the eggs out to know how many more they should freeze. Um, but ideally, um, the, the advantage of uh, freezing your eggs is that you don't need a partner or a sperm donor to fertilize them, and ideally you should have about 14 eggs frozen for one baby. You can also freeze embryos, I call them topsicles. Um, you do need a male partner or sperm donor to freeze embryos. The advantage of freezing embryos over eggs is that there's been hundreds of thousands of babies born from IVF with embryos, um, and the problem is, is that obviously relationships may end, um, so um, hard to use them in the future because of that, or they're hard to disc discard for religious reasons, which is a very hot topic nowadays. Um, in terms of doing IVF, um, again, even a baby can do it. Um, the, the process of IVF takes about 12 days. Um, we usually give a calendar to patients. It does involve shots that have to be done subcutaneous. Most of my patients do the shots themselves. Um, and the shots are about 10 days, so five, shot, five days of two shots a day, and then five days of three shots a day, and it does involve about four ultrasound appointments. And the day of the egg retrieval, I do recommend that my patients take that day off. Um, that involves a procedure, it's about a 15 minute procedure where we put an ultrasound and through it comes a needle, gets the eggs out directly from the ovaries, and this is under ultrasound guidance. Um, so again, it's under fentanyl and propofol, so your sleep shouldn't be driving home that day, shouldn't be alone afterwards. And I would say about 99% of my patients work the next day after the egg retrieval. In terms of what happens with those eggs once you remove them at the egg retrieval, you can either freeze them as eggs, or you can fertilize them with sperm by either putting sperm around the eggs or directly into the eggs. There's a process called intracytoplasmic sperm injection where we pick the best looking sperm and put it directly into the eggs. We allow those um, embryos to fertilize and once they get to day five, once they get to the blastocyst stage, that's when you can either freeze them as embryos or you can do genetic testing on them and figure out if they're normal or not for the future. If you are ready to get pregnant, we do something called an embryo transfer, and this can be done either the next month or um, many years later. I have had a baby frozen for 13 years uh, before mom came back for it. Um, and then we freeze the embryos in liquid nitrogen. And the older you are when you freeze them, the tougher it is to get pregnant. So for example, if you're 30, when you freeze your embryos, you have about a 50% chance of getting pregnant with them when you're in your 40s. However, if you wait till 40 to freeze your embryos then, then the number drops to about 10 to 20%. In terms of genetic testing, this has really revolutionized what I do. Um, the advantage of this is that you can check to see how many normal embryos you have so that you know for sure for the future um, that you're not paying for storage for years and years for abnormal embryos, and then you also know if you should freeze more now when you're younger. Um, I also do this for patients with, for example, Huntington's disease or breast cancer genes. You can actually select the normal embryos to transfer. Um, also for patients with recurrent pregnancy loss um, is, an, is another very important um, way to do this to prevent miscarriages. The way we do the genetic testing is we take out a few cells from the blastocyst stage by, um, by doing a biopsy and then we send them out for genetic testing. And again, the older the woman is, the lower the chance of having normal embryos. So for example, a 40-year-old, one of four of her embryos that have actually made it to day five are normal. In terms of how much time is required as a surgeon to come for appointments to freeze your eggs or embryos, um, there's obviously the initial consultation to see how many eggs you have and your fertility status to make sure that no other hormones are a problem, such as thyroid hormone. Um, for the IVF part, the first appointment takes about two hours because it does require um, an ultrasound, labs, and injection instructions, but the other appointments are pretty quick. They're about 10-minute appointments, and the egg retrieval um, does take um, that whole day to be off, but you're there at the center for about three hours, and then you can work the next day. If you're planning on getting pregnant with a transfer, then that does require three additional appointments, an ultrasound, and then two weeks later, another ultrasound to see how your lining of the uterus is, and then a week later, the transfer. I do recommend taking two days off after the transfer to rest to improve implantation chances. 
If you're doing insemination, where we put the sperm directly into the uterus, um, it's only one or two appointments. If you're doing a natural insemination, if you're doing medicated, it can require two or three appointments. In terms of how can we as physicians help our patients who are surgeons or other doctors, um, or I actually have a lot of lawyer patients actually, um, it's either early or late appointments. Um, we try to see them on the weekends as much as we can. Uh, we try to help them out with samples and pharmacy discount forms and um, trying to order their blood tests at the hospitals that they work at. And most important is having kind colleagues who can cover for them during their appointments. And I've had several residents who have come to me um, during their training and they had very nice attendings that could let them go for their appointments. In terms of financial consideration, obviously this is also important as residents, um, especially are, are still not being paid enough for all their hours they put in. Um, some insurances are starting to cover more egg and embryo freezing. Most of them do cover the workup that we talked about, the blood test and the ultrasound. Um, and if they don't, insemination's um, not as expensive at egg freezing and IVF, which can cost between 10 and $20,000. Um, thank you very much and hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we're now going to have Dr. Evelyn Shu, who's a pediatric surgeon at CHLA, give her uh, personal experience with IVF. Can you guys hear me? I can't see the. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sounds good. Um, I want to thank APSA and the Benji Brooks Committee for allowing me to speak today. So these are my kids right now. Um, they are currently potty trained, um, so I think that's a success. But it took us a long time for us to get pregnant, and I want to share my story with you um, to and um, to discuss like how our careers as surgeons affects our health, and um, for people who have infertility, either men or women, how we can support one another so that we can be successful both professionally and personally. Um, so when I was 11 years old, I knew that I wanted to be a doctor. I worked hard to get into med school, and in med school, I realized that my passion is surgery. So I went to UCSF for general surgery and then I matched into pediatric surgery fellowship. I went straight through from kindergarten to fellowship and I was 35 at that point. I didn't skip any years, um, but I didn't like need any extra training. And so I was 35 at that point. The nine years of surgical training and fellowship were were grueling and intense commitment. So my husband and I delayed having children until my training was complete. Pregnancies in women who are 35 and older are considered geriatric pregnancies, and so that was where I was starting. <laughs> um, I stayed on as faculty where I did my fellowship. During my training, my husband and I were apart for nine years, and we were finally able to live together. At that point, we wanted to start and have a family. We had tried to get pregnant for six months, and when we couldn't, we went to see a reproductive endocrinologist. And after multiple tests, I was diagnosed with decreased ovarian reserve. We went through five IVF procedures between 2017 and 2019. During that time, I was a junior attending, trying to build my practice and academic career and trying to get my master's degree all at the same time. I took most of the holiday calls while being a first year attending, um, at, while being uh, a first year attending. While I was doing that, I was also squeezing in appointments with the reproductive endocrinologist while being on call and generating almost 10,000 RVUs per year. Um, between my fourth and fifth cycles, my reproductive endocrinologist actually spoke to me about doing donor eggs because they thought my likelihood of success after multiple failed attempts was very low. Um, I took a break from IVF cycles at that point and my husband and I took a vacation because IVF and um, my job were really stressful. Surprisingly, we got naturally pregnant when I was on vacation. Unfortunately, when I returned, I had to go in overnight to reduce an inguinal hernia, 
and I subsequently had a miscarriage. That was disheartening, but I knew that I could at least get pregnant. <laughs> Um, we decided to give one final attempt with IVF for a fifth time and got naturally pregnant with twins. Um, I was literally shocked. <laughs> I graduated from the REA clinic, but I was sick with nausea and vomiting for my first trimester and part of my second. My second trimester was better and I was gaining weight, um, but I began having symptoms of carpal tunnel in both hands, which made operating very difficult and painful. Early in my pregnancy, my husband had started to look for some things for the baby's names, strollers to buy, car seats to buy, um, but I couldn't think about that because I'm a pediatric surgeon and I know what happens to babies that are born early. Um, and that happens in IVF and especially in twin pregnancies. And so I couldn't actually think that they would be living until they were 24 weeks gestation. Um, my third trimester was extremely difficult. I was going for twice weekly exams and ultrasounds. Um, my exams were all normal, my blood pressure was fine, I had no proteinuria. I continued to work full time, taking overnight call every two to three nights. I started to develop swelling in my lower extremities when I stood up, and towards the end of my pregnancy, I had swelling all throughout the day. I also had extreme itching at the end of my day towards the end of my pregnancy. I started maternity leave at 34 weeks on December 2nd, 2019, because I was just enormous by then and what should have been the most joyous occasion of my life, the birth of Josephine and Elliot, actually turned into the most traumatic moment of my life thus far. Three days after I went on medical leave, I woke up in the middle of the night because my legs were itching. I didn't want to disturb my husband who was sleeping, so I used the guest bathroom to wash my legs. My husband found me in the guest bathroom and said, what are you doing? I didn't respond, I just kept washing my legs. Um, and so he helped me dry them off and I went back to bed. In hindsight, I believe at that point that I had already had the stroke because I couldn't speak. That day, December 5th, 2019, when I was 34 weeks pregnant with twins, I had a left hemorrhagic stroke. I am so grateful to my parents who came to visit me from San Diego late in the morning. They came in the house and noticed that I wasn't talking. They asked me what was wrong, and I couldn't say anything. My mom noticed that my smile was asymmetric, and she said to my dad, call the ambulance. When the ambulance got to my house, they had me sit in a wheelchair, and they took my heart rate and blood pressure. My heart rate was in the 90s, but my blood pressure was 140s over 100s, and I thought, this must be preeclampsia. I remember going to Kaiser and seeing the ER physician um, there, but I don't remember anything else. And, but my mother said I kept looking at the blood pressure cuff reading. I don't remember anything else. Um, I had an emergency C section at Kaiser, even though I don't have Kaiser insurance. And then I was transferred to Cedar sinai where there was a neurosurgeon. They did an angiogram to look for an AV malformation or aneurysm, which I didn't have. They monitored me for several hours and then decided to perform a left craniotomy because the hemorrhage had increased in size and I developed right-sided paralysis. After these surgeries, I was in the neuro ICU. When I woke up, I didn't even remember that I was pregnant with twins. I remember my husband showing me pictures of the babies when I was still intubated in the ICU, introducing me to Josephine and Elliot. I was like, who are these babies? 
I was intubated for 10 days, and it was until, until after I was extubated that I started to realize that those babies were my children. The babies were in the NICU, and I wasn't able to see them in person until after I left the ICU. I only saw them for three days before I was transferred to an inpatient rehab facility. I was in the rehab facility for four weeks, not able to see my babies during that time. And it wasn't until after I was discharged from inpatient rehab in mid-January of 2020 that I got to see Elliot and Josephine and bond with them for the first time. With rehab, I regained my ability to speak again. I'm not as witty as I was before the surgery. Before the stroke, I could speak extemporaneously at events like this. Now I need to have the words in front of me or I need to practice my talks like multiple times. My neurosurgeons performed an angiogram and multiple MRIs at the time of the stroke and they couldn't find any active bleeding or structural causes. Six months after, I had a follow-up MRI and angiogram which were unremarkable. So they had presumed that I had sudden onset preeclampsia with severe features, which had caused the stroke. Since April of 2021, I've started working part-time and now I'm operating independently. The transition of working from part-time to full-time has been exceedingly frustratingly slow, but I have to remember that about 50% of people who have a hemorrhagic stroke don't survive. And I have survived and thrived. <laughs> and I will continue to change the surgical culture going forward. I want to thank everybody who had texted me while, while I was sick um, in the hospital, came to visit me, sent me flowers and cards, and have continued to support me thus far. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Xu. Our last speaker will be Dr. Eugene Kim, who will be talking about um, culture for change and uh, what we can do in the future. Whew. Jeez, that's hard. It's hard to hear. It was really hard to see. And, uh, you know, as some of you may know, you know, as her partner, it was really hard to see. And, um, I think what's special about pediatric surgeons is that we, um, we, we stand up for what's right, um, whether it's for our patients, in this case it's for a partner. And, um, and it led me to reach out to Erica uh, about a month later at a meeting and just said, what can we do about this, what can we, and it, it, it led to I think some data that we all suspected. Um, and then, um, uh, it's really, I think, um, kind of lit up the academic surgical world and helped them uh, better understand and hopefully prepare for the future. And, and this is where this part of the talk comes in. And I think first and foremost, it's about changing the culture. Like hearing stories like this, and there's so many stories already out there. And um, you know, I heard a lot about Dr. Freischlag's stories and people that we know and respect, but it had just been kind of under the carpet for a long time. And so now I think it's front and center and it's time that we change the culture. It starts from the top down. Um, this is not going away. More and more of our colleagues are women. And so, um, um, and it starts with us in this group. And so I think of this, you know, as, as three major pillars of, of helping uh, our colleagues, extending the support uh, for the entire spectrum of pregnancy, adjusting operative workload, and creating an improved environment for our nursing mothers postpartum. Uh, but change is hard. There's culture issues. Uh, these things cost money, and the flexibility of our call schedules and our work duties are very difficult. These are things that prevent these things from happening. So when we published this paper, 
um, we um, decided to put something at the end, and we weren't sure whether we were going to put it, but it was a huge table of recommendations. It's not typically something that goes into a data paper, but we're so glad we did because so many people have written it back to us saying how much it's helped them and give them a little bit of a uh, foundation to, to build from. And so from a training programs, and this is all from our table four from the paper, um, scheduling flexibility for our pregnant trainees, at least six weeks of paid parental leave, exclusive of vacation time, and I think we are seeing this more and more uh, even with faculty. Uh, Non-childbearing residents should be encouraged to take full parental leave. Um, fellowship programs should be prepared to delay the start of new trainees who extend training after maternity leave. And backup service coverage during the leave should be provided by moonlighting physicians or advanced practice clinicians. And we're starting to use these extenders a bit more, uh, but it's, it's, it's time we actually formally put this together. Uh, in addition, pregnant residents should not be asked to make up call shifts missed during maternity leave. Nursing residents should be supported after delivery. And uh, we, you know, I, I'm, I'm so happy. I've seen quite a few nursing mothers who, who've operated with me and, uh, um, um, and they've, they've asked me, oh, I need to step out. I'm like, oh, yes, yes, do that. That's great, you know, <laughs> because I'm thinking about our, our own work. And I'm, I'm glad that the residents um, are, are comfortable to, to ask us that. Um, we're seeing this now for more flexibility by the American Board of Surgery uh, to offer the qualifying exam more than one time a year. Flexibility with research requirements for our residents and developing a mentoring pool of surgeon mothers uh, to help guide and advise our mothers at our, at our individual programs. On an institutional level, we need to think about the ability for pregnant surgeons to reduce operative commitments, particularly during the third trimester without financial penalty. And many of our practices are very RVU driven and incentivized. A minimum of 12 weeks of paid parental leave, exclusive of vacation, that's probably a stretch for many of our institutions. Um, surgeons should not be required to make up missed calls or sustain revenue loss that result from leave. And additional clinical duties taken by colleagues should also be compensated. So there's that, not this feeling of, of um, the other colleagues taking on a lot more and, 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 and having their own families uh, uh, take the hit for this. Other things, um, surgeons should be afforded appropriate time off to seek and undergo assisted reproductive technology treatment, uh, dedicated and private lactation space with proximity to the operating room and clinical spaces. I, I think this is a big one because, um, you know, I, I talked to Ellen and, and Erica and, and the places that, um, that they are running off to, to do this between cases and patients is certainly below um, their status. And I, I've heard, you know, uh, broom closets and bathrooms, and um, and so um, um, that's something that 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 needs to be uh, considered. All of our hospitals, uh, better provision of on-site childcare with priority for our trainees, um, ergonomic consultation for pregnant surgeons. We have found that uh, there's a much higher incidence of musculoskeletal issues with our pregnant surgeons, and timely referral to mental health resources for postpartum depression. Um, this paper was published uh, um, um, uh, earlier this year. Um, Michaela Bamdad and Michael Engels be the program director at Michigan. And um, it was really a remarkable program that they put together. Um, and, uh, and I'll go through this a little bit. Um, and it, it hit on multiple things. With regards to prenatal health, um, they, uh, the pregnant residents are free to attend their prenatal visits without stigma or pushback. And it's not the responsibility of the pregnant resident to ask favors or arrange the trades to attend these medical appointments, but the coverage is built into their schedule in the same manner as anything else that is scheduled. Another aspect is the main maintenance of health and well-being. Um, pregnant residents are supported in leaving the operating room during non-critical portions to do all the things that normal people do. <laughs> and uh, uh, all of which in maintaining maternal and fetal health. Um, also, they had special considerations for work hours and rotation schedules to minimize disruptions to sleep and circadian rhythms. During that third trimester, work shifts are limited to 12 hours and restricted to daytime work only. So that's, that's pretty amazing. 
and for rotations with overnight home call, alternative schedules were made available for those residents as well. Um, there was also at the same time support for non-birthing parents. Um, uh, there were scheduled accommodations are also available for the non-birthing uh, uh, parents to attend some of these prenatal appointments um, as well as their time off afterwards. And importantly, and I think we've, we've seen this particularly with the uh, uh, departmental leadership um, at Michigan, uh, in establishing a culture where pregnancy during clinical and research periods were tr during the training period was fully supported and discriminatory behavior about family planning or parental status was not tolerated. I, I called Michael Englesby when I saw this paper. I said, this is amazing. How, how do you do this? How do you get buy-in? How do you get, what, what do you think about the other residents? And he said, well, you got to buy in to be here. And if you don't want to be here and you don't believe in this stuff, then we don't want you here. I was just like, well, it's as simple as that. He did admit there were challenges behind it and they haven't got it quite worked out. But just by putting this down um, is a huge step forward in changing culture. Um, I think one of the important things that we're doing is just continuing to press um, the uh, accelerator down and continue to publish and get the word out and just making people know that this issue is not going away and everybody needs to adapt. It, came, it started off with our own um, JAMA surgery paper um, and then followed by a, a, a subsequent paper in the Annals of Surgery and then um, this paper coming out in the Journal of the American College of Surgeons looking at all the facets of the difficulties with um, our pregnant surgeon colleagues. Um, we've also looked at the examination of the lack of workplace leading to major pregnancy complications and that was recently published in Chicago at the American Surgical and I think that was really well um, uh, received and that's definitely a group of people who needed to hear this message and, and I think it was uh, really well heard. And then some of the other projects going working with the project with our Phoenix Children's colleagues, um, the stuff coming out with the second trial and there's a lot of people, the ACS Board of Governors are looking at putting out a, a more comprehensive um, 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 survey with the entire American College of Surgeons, which I think was one of um, our big criticisms in our early papers in, in getting uh, as many people um, uh, surveyed. So with that, um, I wanna thank you for your attention. I think change starts with people like us in this group and to make sure that we normalize, which is one of the most normal things uh, that we could do, so thank you. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Kim, and um, thank you to all of our speakers. We'd like to open up uh, for any questions, both virtual as well as in person. Dr. Shu, thank you for telling that story. And I can tell you the first time I heard it was when Eugene told your story, which at his presidential speech at AAS was the single most important presidential speech I have ever seen. And I wasn't there in person, I watched it online, I was bawling the way I'm sure everyone else was, but this change that happened to you, this horrible thing that happened to you, has resulted in a national swell of attention brought by Dr. Rangel and Dr. Kim that I could not be more grateful for. My question is this, Eugene, how much does this cost? I wanna hear about that 12-week paid leave I've presented this to Dan Osley. How about we get a fund? I mean, can you get a $2 million endowment or something that would then fund these pregnant surgeons during that time? And what a recruitment tool that would be. How much should we raise? Yeah. And I think what, what a recruitment tool that is for Michigan, just to put these things in place. Um, Oh, Jessica, were you going to give the dollar amount? <laughs> so at the University of Chicago, um, parents get 12 weeks of paid leave, both men and women. So the other thing, and, and this is actually consistent with the long-term strategic priority. Um, so there's a school at the University of Chicago called the Lab School where you can send your kids from age three to age 18, it's a great school, and it means that the turnover um, for families is 5% per year as opposed to 10% per year for most academic institutions. If you invest in families, you have a more stable workforce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it pays for itself. 
Um, the other thing I, I just wanted to add is that um, as there get to be more women in surgery, cultures really change. So there are 13 surgeons in my group. Eight of them are women. Um, four of them have children. One of them is having her first child in July. We hope this baby will wait till then. <laughs> but um, what that has done is really liberate the young fathers um, in our practice um, to talk about their needs. Yeah. You know, the days that their children are sick or their babysitter had COVID or the you know, school closed down. Um, and I think cultural change is um, really important. This is not a women's problem. This is a family problem. Evelyn, I thought I was done crying about this, but apparently not. <laughs> um, Eugene, like, thank you for that talk. I have a kind of a question comment on the, the idea of these recommendations, which I think are very much needed, but things like, you know, fellowships should adjust for a delayed start for someone who needs to take extra training. I think when I talk to people, that's a great idea, but how do you try to convince people they're gonna implement that? Because I went through, you know, I, I was fortunate to have my baby well before training, um, so I didn't have to do that. But even watching my fellowship do the transition from the July to the August start, you would have thought everyone was dying. Um, and I personally was the one to kind of fill those gaps. And it was, and I say this somewhat cautiously, but not really, with six of my formal faculty in the room, I counted. Um, no one was willing to make adjustments. They were like, we're not gonna deal with that call. Uh, and so if that was the attitude just from changing to July to August start, being like, oh dear God, we don't have a fellow for those four weeks, we're gonna die. How do you convince people to delay a start? Because I look at this room and there's wonderful people, but if anyone said, hey, your fellow's showing up six weeks late, I really don't know how that would be received. So how do you do that? Shannon, these are all hard questions. <laughs> you, you know me. <laughs> And, and Kathy's question was really hard as well. And I, I mean, to, to answer her question, first and foremost, you know, it's, it's not a division's problem. The division is too small to handle this. This is a medical school problem. This is a university problem. And I think at that level, that's where you support. Um, USC, I think, is one of the more forward institutions, and they've given 10 weeks off for both maternity and paternity. Um, they haven't figured out a way to compensate that. They just said, okay, you get 10 weeks off, boom. So good, I'm glad that happened. It happened to one of uh, my um, male partners, and he took 10 weeks off, and it was hard, but you know, we totally believed in that, and we were behind it, and it happened, and it was great for him and his new baby. But, but you know, one, do you put, the, do you put this, uh, this in place and then just try to figure it out later? Do you find the money first? I, I don't know, and, and different institutions are doing different things for that. But I agree with you, Shannon. It's, it's really hard, and flexibility is really hard in surgery as well. And so these are the things we need to figure out. Adrian Kerna from Idaho. Um, my heart goes out for what you went through, and I, I am encouraged that so many women are in surgery now because it, it brings it to light, not just for you all, but also for the silent spouses of ours who are at home and who suffer from the residency. Um, Forty years ago, um, my wife lost a baby with my schedule like it was, which then tormented her, and ten years later, she divorced me over it. And uh, her life has been tragically uh, destroyed. Um, and so I think, and as a, as a male 40 years ago, we just toughed it up and it was what was expected of us and I wasn't forgiving of my wife for what she was going through. But I think uh, I like what Michigan is doing, you know, where they're recognizing both, that both parents are part of the pregnancy, whether it's a man and a wife or two men or two women, it's, it's a, it's a it's a family thing, and for the health going forward of families. Um, but I, I don't want to take away from the pain that you went through. And I, w I wish you, 
Uh, and, and when I see those beautiful children and your husband, I know what's going forward. It's a wonderful life. And you know what's um, so great is that this all happened to me, but I'm so glad that it didn't happen to my children. Um, that's the only thing that I'm thankful for. Hi, I'm Liz um, from Tacoma, Washington, and thank you for sharing your story. Really touching, I think really moving. And, you know, as surgeons, we definitely have problems with infertility, right? But it's also all women physicians. So there's one in four women physicians that have infertility issues. And I think it's, I'd love to, I'd love to hear that we are having institutional changes, but I'd love to see national changes. Um, and so I think that this is a great opportunity to really collaborate with larger organizations. And, you know, it'd be nice to have, you know, community private practice hospitals who have surgeons who are RVU-based also be supported in that. Look at our contracts, make sure that we don't have clauses that even if partners do cover, the hospital still requires that you take call, those kind of things. So I think it's huge. I'm so glad that APSA is focusing on this. and. And I love being part of a program that supports both, you know, women and men in raising families. So thank you. Thank you. Ron Hirsch, Lane Arbor. So thank you very much for uh, sharing. Uh, thank you very much for your presentations. Uh, I, I think this is wonderful that we're discussing this. Um, and I thank APSA for putting this on the program. Um, I will say that um, I wish we were on day one. And uh, we should be. We should be talking about this on day one. I also think there is a paucity of Y chromosomes in this room. And so we should be talking about it on day one, and we should be celebrating this not just with, with, with all our members. Um, and we have many y, y chromosomes, but not enough. So um, uh, I would, would you know, push APSA to to embrace it and, uh, and make it uh, uh, at the front of this, uh, this meeting. Um, my question is, uh, has to do, you know, we talked about the cost and we talked about coverage. Um, what about the training? And so our, for our fellows, and, and um, you know, can we, can we take 12 weeks out of two years of training and will we be okay? Should we extend the time of that training? Um, just what are your thoughts around this? Casper Wang is sitting here, he's about to rise. And, <laughs> and, you know, um, you, know the, it, it, you know, we want to make sure we have quality pediatric surgeons, and yet we also absolutely want to support and, and respect everything that you've been discussing. Thank you again. Yeah, so um, the solution is from moving away from prescribed time periods of training and minimum case numbers. But that's where we're at right now. We are moving towards competency-based assessments. We are moving towards this thing called entrustable professional activities. It is imbued into the residency training of a number of subspecialties. It's coming to general surgery. We're all gonna see it in general surgery very, very soon. And we're going to implement this in pediatric surgery too so that it will be based on your maturation of competencies, of specific activities, be it an operation or be it an interaction with uh, the parents of a sick neonate and how you handle and comport yourself and interact and create that relationship. Um, we're doing that. So we have a task force. We're going to put it together. It's going to take a little while. We're going to vet it with the program directors. We're going to vet it with the RC, um, and we're going to do it that way. So uh, it's not going to be an immediate change. I don't think we, we're ready for that, but we recognize the need to adjust the way we assess the competency of our trainees. I guess, I guess oh my. my question for you, and you may not be able to answer this, is like if somebody doesn't make those requirements, like by the time they graduate in January, um, like July, like, um, so then what happens? Like, um, do they extend the training like three more months, six more months? Like, 
Um, and I think that's a question for everybody, not. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's a tough one, and yeah. that, you're absolutely right. It's, it's one thing if you finish early and you hit all of your EPAs early. It's another thing if, if, you, if you need a little bit of extra time yeah. to master a particular and I, skill. And, I think that's okay, right? Right, that's okay, and we have, you're right, we have to figure that out. Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that yet. Um, uh, that's a big part of what we're talking about. Um, and uh, certainly we would love to get input from others and, and this is not gonna be an a American Board of Surgery, Pediatric Surgery Board decision. We're, we're working on this. We fully recognize that the complexities related to the current two-year block of training and the need to move the factory line along and get the next trainee in and what does that mean if, if you have extra time for your chief fellow and then you bring in the new fellow. I, I mean, I honestly think it's gonna be easier to do that at larger training programs, but that's not necessarily fair and an easy solution for smaller training programs. So I, I don't know, I think it's gonna require creativity amongst all of us and uh, an openness and a willingness to change from the traditional way that we've been doing things. Thank you. Um, I'm Joanne Berg. I'm from Albuquerque. And um, Evelyn, I'd just like to encourage you because I've always had to write things down and I always have to practice my talks. Um, so it hasn't held me back too badly, I don't think. Um, so I just wanted to make a few more kind of comprehensive comments, of course. Thank you so much for such an excellent session. It was really appreciated and really important. And um, I'd just like to comment that, you know, as surgeons, we are still human. And I think what you're talking about is that surgeons are part of humanity, too. And um, humans do need each other. And this is something we forget. Um, and this is the cultural change, is that um, children need their parents. Parents need their children. Like Evelyn, you said your parents were there. Men need women, women need men. We, we actually, humans, uh, part of being human is that we need each other. And having a family is a very normal, just part of being human. So that uh, was one thing. I mean, our motto is saving lifetimes, and that also includes us and our babies and our children, not just always other people. Um, and then I would like to say thank you so much, Eugene, for the, putting down the Michigan program. Um, I would comment that managing these issues is just part of being a good professional manager. So if you're a division head, a division chief, a chair, um, this, is, this is part of good, solid, professional management of your department. And, um, you know, Dr. Wang has mentioned some of the details, but um, this should just become a very accepted part of human resource management. It goes on in other jobs, it goes on in other countries. Um, it's, it should just be normalized. And um, not only should it not be tolerated like you put on your slide, but um, everyone should just be aware it's actually illegal to discriminate um, against uh, in pregnancy. And um, as professional managers, we don't you know, want to have things ever get to that point, but just something to, to just be aware of. Um, so th those are my comments. I had to write them all down. Didn't have time to practice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Nguyen. Evelyn, thank you so much yeah. for doing this, all of you. Um, I wanted to um, ask a few questions, bringing it back to the beginning of the panel. Um, back to the idea of this leading to burnout. Dr. Rangel, um, in your research, What's the percentage of women surgeons that leave their careers early because of things like what happened to them early career, i.e. what happened to Evelyn? And I preface this by saying as someone who spent three years of my life doing basic science research to become a pediatric surgeon, I specifically went into community 
because I got pregnant and the response I got was not what I expected. And I am hearing your talk, Dr. Diogarte, I was in that 5%. So I was lucky enough to not have to do those things, but I know a lot of people do, and by those things I mean the IVF. And if uh, people don't remember from the slides, $20,000 for one round, so five rounds, that's the 100 grand. And um, I, the other thing, so that's my question for Dr. Rangel and for Dr. Diogarte, those injections are hormones, and hormones have psychological side effects. So I have a lot of friends, a lot of them not in medicine, um, who do go through the injections. And um, just to put it bluntly, it messes with their life and the way they interact with their partner. And it can wreck their lives. What's the psychological support or recommendation you give to women when they go through the IVF? Um, and is any of that from a practical standpoint covered? Because the other issue, part of it is, you know, taking mental health breaks, some of these things in the real world, it goes on your record. It affects your privileging at the hospital. I sit on the credentialing committee at Huntington, and we do review that as time lost. And women have to explain if they took three months off, because it looks like a gap. And uh, the other part of it, as I just wanted to bring up, um, I think, um, one of the other members brought up, you know, we have a lot of big academic programs and there is support. Yes, the state of California will give you 12 weeks, they won't pay for it. Uh, the state of Nevada, where my first job was, there was no guideline. They wanted me to take four weeks and I said, hell no. So, but they gave me the time, it still wasn't paid. So there's some practical parts of it, especially for surgeons in the community, a lot of women surgeons in community, like using short-term disability to pay for it, and I think um, it behooves us to provide some of those resources and information for women who want to do it. And I finally want to point out, you know, we're surgeons, we're creative. If we want to get something done, we can get it done. We get stuff done fast. So I want to, I'm glad that uh, the people in Michigan have that attitude about residency, and I, I really believe, because I've heard for so many years that, well, there's a problem, we know the problem is there, but we're working on fixing it. And I've been a resident, I mean, I, I was PGY-11 <laughs> when I went into training, so going back to the 5% chance, that's the other thing. So finally, um, would there be a way to, to fix this on a state-by-state -state basis? Because again, the laws are different, and the funding can come from state covering parental leave. And finally, I will say that I trained in Canada, and in Canada, the healthcare system functions when people take about 50 weeks off after pregnancy, full paid. And uh, I, I'm hearing these stories. I am so incredibly grateful for that training and for the fact that not a single person asked the question when my co-fellow had to take time off to go be present for the ultrasound for his pregnant wife, and when I took time off to go check my ovaries, because I was 38, and I wanted to see if I could have a baby. So thank you. Thank you for all your great comments. Those are all great questions and comments. Um, just to answer your questions about hormones and how they affect you, luckily, the hormones have gotten better throughout the years. They used to be intramuscular, now they're subcutaneous. Um, there's also less ways to minimize something called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome by doing something called the Lupron trigger. Um, so a lot of the my patients that go through fertility hormones, honestly about 90% just have mild symptoms. Some do have um, mood changes, uh, but most actually do okay with the side effects. Um, I, I feel that if they have a supportive partner that's involved with the shots, or if they're doing acupuncture, actually that can help minimize some of their symptoms. If they're taking certain supplements and just eating a very good balanced diet can actually help. Um, with their side effects, and also just having supportive people that cover for them. They don't have to lie about where they're at. Um, I've written letters for my patients to take, give them a week off um, during the treatment, especially during the transfer process, just to have uh, more time or try to coordinate 
with birth control pills so things land on the weekend or vacations to minimize their stress. Um, when I was a fellow, um, I was lucky to actually be able to plan it um, so that I would land my first baby during my research year. So when for infertility, we do three years of training, we do two years of clinical, one year of research. So it actually worked out that I um, it landed during my research year, but I was still publishing my papers on bed rest. Well, I was on bed rest actually for from 28 weeks till about 36 weeks, but I was still working from home. Um, and I took uh, five weeks off um, after both babies, of which I had to use my vacation. Um, but, but it was during research year, so I didn't have to make up my fellowship. So that can help just planning it during a research year. Um, I'll answer the question about burnout. So um, <clears throat> we have about 16% of surgical trainees will change the subspecialty they were going to go into, specifically because of perceptions of imbalance between family and professional demands. And when you look, break that down by specialty, the number one and number two specialties that people change out of are surge onc and pediatric surgery. And so um, surge onc is about 58% of, make up about 58% of that 16% and ped surgery I think is in the 40s percentage wise. I think the answer is not easy, but a mentorship is sorely lacking right now. We um, at the Brigham have established a formal mentorship program um, that we're gonna, you know, put out in publication mostly because I think broadly disseminating that is valuable. I think a lot of talking about this, there's a really um, high level discussions about who pays for parental leave, but there's also a ton of low hanging fruit. And culture change doesn't happen. There's no magic bullet, right? There's never gonna be something where you say, if you just paid for parental leave, people aren't gonna be burned out. It's a multi-pronged approach. So if you can pick off the low hanging fruit, you can have lactation policies, you can have mentorship programs. Every pediatric surgeon in here can be a really critical mentor to a pregnant resident who wants to be you. And you don't know they're watching you, how you balance your family life. Um, Sean and I are at Boston, and I think I try to be very open about you know, he picks up the kids, I bring my kids to this conference, they're probably hanging out outside somewhere. <laughs> but you are, you're living that life that you're showing for your resident and they're watching you. If you make it look hard and impossible, they're gonna run away. And most of them are doing, um, you know, the biggest ones are going to general surgery and breast surgery. Um, <clears throat> in terms of, um, I think somebody else was talking about uh, sort of s kind of piggybacking on what you were talking about. Um, we're seeing the people who are getting more support are the people who are on bed rest. I don't know if everybody knows in this room that bed rest is something that is no longer recommended by ACOG for most pregnancies, right? There's no data to show that you're gonna have a better outcome because you're on bed rest. So we wrote all of this with an MFM. You know, we don't have data to prove why people are getting bed rest prescriptions, but the implication a lot of the times is that your OBGYN is gonna give you that prescription because that's the only way you can get out of work. But there's something, there's like a moderation, right? Just because you're not on bed rest doesn't mean that it's okay to work 80 hours a week. And those are the ones where you're pushing into pregnancy complications. So women should be able to sort of, you know, we should respect them as professionals to be able to regulate how much they're able to work without having to be on bed rest. Thank you so much. We have to wrap up. Um, it's been a great conversation. We've already gone over our time, and we will respect the next session is about to start. So we will leave. Um, but thank you so much. I've uh, commented we need to build a toolkit with these things from different institutions. Um, I've already gotten Dr. Rangel's um, uh, mentorship program to introduce at Michigan. Um, but we will uh, certainly try to build that for APSA. Thanks so much.